Drishtadyumna, Draupadi's brother, was witness to the marriage of Draupadi to the Pandavas. Upon returning to Panchal, he informed Drupad that the Brahmin who had won Draupadi's hand at her Swayamva was actually Arjun, the Pandav. He told Drupad that those accompanying him were his brothers. Drupad was happy upon hearing the news. What saddened him, however, was Draupadi's marriage to all five brothers. The news of Draupadi's marriage to the Pandavas spread all over. The Kauravas smoldered with anger and jealousy. To decide their next plan, Duryodhan called upon his counsel with Kan by his side. The Kauravas sought advice from Bhishma, who suggested that the only proper course of action would be to call the Pandavas back and give them a certain part of the kingdom. Drone, who was also present at the council, suggested that a messenger be sent to bring the Pandavas back to Hastinapur. After much debate, the Kauravas finally decided to send Vidur to fetch the Pandavas who were living under the protection of the king of Panchal. Vidur reached the kingdom of Panchal and conveyed the message to Drupad and the Pandavas. Although suspicious of their intentions, the Pandavas agreed on returning to Hastinapur with Vidur. The Pandavas were welcomed to Hastinapur with great pomp and celebration. A special ceremony was organized in which Yudhishthir was crowned the king by Dhritarashtra and was given the kingdom of Khandavprast. They were being sent away from Hastinapur for fear that people would demand Yudhishthir to rule. They also knew that staying in Hastinapur with their envious cousins would lead to more discords and may even result in war. The land of Khandavprast that was given to the Pandavas was barren, with no habitation. The forested land was cursed by Lord Indra and was inhabited only by Asuras, Rakshasas and Nagas. Since Yudhishthir did not want bloodshed and war, he decided to move into Khandavprast. Two days after leaving Hastinapur, the Pandavas reached Khandavprast and found before them an endless stretch of wasteland. Krishna, who had accompanied the Pandavas all along, came to their help. He invited Vishwakarma, the divine architect, to design the kingdom for the Pandavas. During their stay in the forest, Arjun and Krishna met Agni, who was hungry and wanted to burn the forest to satisfy his hunger. Krishna and Arjun knew that burning the forest would be advantageous to them as it would rid them of the Asuras, Rakshasas and Nagas. Before Vishwakarma started work on building the kingdom, the forests that surrounded Khandavprast were cleared by wildfires. The barren land of Khandavprast was made into a beautiful looking city with a magnificent palace, wide streets, gardens, streams and parks. The Pandavas named their new kingdom Indraprastha, since it was built in resemblance to Indra's own city. After the city of Indraprastha was complete, people from Hastinapur started flocking into Indraprastha. Yudhishthir distributed land to the residents and gave them mansions. In Hastinapur, when the news of the magical city of Indraprastha reached Duryodhan, he was filled with envy. He blamed Dhritarashtra for giving Khandavprast to the Pandavas. This event caused Duryodhan to call upon his council to plan their next move against the Pandavas. After the city of Indraprast was completed, Krishna took leave of the Pandavas. On his way back, he met Narad and requested him to visit the Pandavas at their new kingdom. Upon Krishna's request, Narad Muni visited the Pandavas at Indraprast. The Pandavas sought Narad's guidance in the administration of the kingdom and also introduced Draupadi to him. When Narad met Draupadi, a worried look took over his face. He was reminded of the story of the two Asur brothers, Sundar and Upasundar. 
When Yudhishthir asked Narad what his cause of worry was, Narad narrated the story of the Asur brothers to the Pandavas. Narad told them that Sundar and Upasundar were two brothers who were extremely devoted to each other and were inseparable just like the Pandav brothers. They knew that the only way death could approach them was if they killed each other. However, fate took its own course when the two brothers fell in love with the same woman called Tilotama. Tilotama was a beautiful woman who was created by Vishwakarma under Indra's instructions. Vishwakarma had collected 10 million gems and took small parts of each gem to create Tilotama. Upon seeing her, Sundar and Upasundar fell in love and each of them desired her for himself. The trouble began when one day Upasundar walked into Sundar's chamber and found Sundar and Tilotama together. This led to a quarrel between the two brothers and it soon took the shape of a duel in which they ended up killing each other. The Pandavas shivered as they heard Narad narrate the story to them. Narad told them that Tilotama was as beautiful and dark-skinned as Draupadi and warned them that their love for Draupadi might cause disputes among them. He told the Pandavas that they have many missions to fulfill and for that they have to stand together. When the Pandavas asked Narad for a solution, Narad suggested that beginning with Yudhishthir, every brother must keep Draupadi as his wife for a year. During this one year, Draupadi will be exclusively the wife of one brother. And if anyone intrudes, he should go on exile for 12 years. The Pandavas agreed to Narad's arrangement. Having accomplished his purpose of visiting the Pandavas, Narad took leave of the Pandavas. The news of the arrangement reached Draupadi, who moved into Yudhishthir's chamber. The arrangement seemed to be working well until one day, when fate took its own turn for Arjun. The arrangement proposed by Narad seemed to be working fine until one day when an unfortunate problem arose. Arjun was in his balcony when he suddenly heard the painful cries of a Brahmin. When Arjun asked him what the matter was, the Brahmin told him that a group of thieves had broken into his hut in broad daylight and stolen his cows. Arjun was shocked to hear that there were thieves in Indraprasth. No sooner did Arjun promise help to the Brahmin than he was reminded that his weapons were in Yudhishthir's chambers. According to the arrangement set by Narad, it was Yudhishthir's turn to have Draupadi as his wife for a year. Arjun knew that stepping into Yudhishthir's chambers would mean 12 years of exile, but Dharm was above all and he had to help the Brahmin immediately. Arjun rushed into Yudhishthir's chambers to fetch his bow. From outside the door, he heard Yudhishthir and Draupadi together. After mustering his courage, he spoke from the door and told Yudhishthir that the Brahmin needed his help and that he had come to fetch his bow. Without waiting for a response, Arjun walked in to collect his weapons and rushed to help the Brahmin. Arjun knew that he had sentenced himself to 12 years of exile. He asked the Brahmin to guide him the way to the forest. Both Arjun and the Brahmin sped their way into the forest and followed the thieves. In no time, Arjun attacked the thieves and rounded up the cows and handed them over to the Brahmin. Upon returning to Indraprasth, Arjun was filled with shame. He was ready to leave Indraprasth when Yudhishthir stopped him and asked him to stay. He told Arjun that he was only performing his duty and that he should not punish himself by leaving Indraprasth. Arjun bowed to Yudhishthir and told him that it would be wrong for him to stay back. Thus, Arjun took leave of his brothers. Kunti and Draupadi begged him to reconsider his decision, but he would not listen. Arjun took leave of his mother and set out for exile with a group of Brahmins. After saving the Brahmins' cows, 
Arjun leaves Indraprastha with a group of Brahmins. Arjun, along with a group of Brahmins, set forth on his journey towards the Himalayas. Upon reaching the Himalayas, Arjun decided to stay by the lake that formed the source of the river Ganga. The Brahmins together built simple shelters for themselves and lit fires to keep themselves warm. In the morning, Arjun would bathe in the waters of the holy river and meditate in the night. Arjun spent months this way without any desire or any temptations. One day when Arjun was bathing in the lake, he was suddenly pulled down by a hostile force. The force rendered him unconscious and he could do nothing to resist it. When Arjun opened his eyes, he saw before him a young woman with eternal grace. She introduced herself as Ulupi, the daughter of Nag Kauravya, who is the king of Nag Lok. She even told Arjun that she loves Arjun and that she wants to marry him. Arjun told her about Draupadi and that he had sworn to be a brahmachari. It would be wrong to give in to temptation. However, Ulupi's eternal beauty and grace made Arjun give in to temptation. Arjun and Ulupi spent months together in the lake until one day when Arjun realized that it was time for him to leave. He bade farewell to Ulupi and dived out of the lake. After returning to his companions, Arjun told them that it was time for them to leave for their next destination. Before leaving, they offered their last prayers to the Ganga and ascended mountain. On their way, they visited the ashrams of Agastya, Vashishta, and Brigu. The long journey had taken its toll on their appearance. By now, they had grown long beards and looked like sannyasis. Upon reaching Kalinga, the Brahmins grew weary of the journey and bade farewell to Arjun. Arjun, however, continued his travels as he was determined to see the whole of Bharatvarsh. His journey soon took him to the kingdom of Manalur. In Manalur, King Chitrasen welcomed Arjun to his palace. Arjun stayed in the palace disguised as a Brahmin. It was during his stay that he fell in love with Chitrasen's daughter, Chitrangada. After much thought, Arjun asked Chitrasen his daughter's hand in marriage. Arjun was married to Chitrangada after which he spent three years in Manalur. Arjun, however, could not stop his heart from wanting to go back to Indraprasth. After Chitrangada bore Arjun a child, he decided to leave Manalur and go back to his brothers. One night after everybody had fallen asleep, Arjun stole out of the city and set out towards Indraprasth. Arjun travelled through harsh lands and visited all the shrines and ashrams that came his way. After travelling for days, Arjun finally reached Prabhasa, the city which lay at the outskirts of the kingdom of Dwarka. When Krishna heard of Arjun's arrival, he went to meet him at Prabhasa. They embraced each other with joy. Krishna and Arjun spent a few days together at the Rivataka mountain. Together, they feasted and engaged in revelry. During their stay, Arjun told Krishna all about his adventures and his visits to the shrines. Krishna told Arjun that all his experiences were destined to happen. One of the reasons for Arjun's visit to Dwarka was to confess his feelings about Krishna's sister Subhadra. Stories of Subhadra's untold beauty and elegance had aroused curiosity in Arjun who was determined to marry her. Krishna, however, was not unaware of Arjun's feelings towards Subhadra. Thus, when Arjun confessed his feelings towards Subhadra and sought his permission to marry her, Krishna happily agreed. However, there was a problem. Krishna told Arjun that his alliance with Subhadra might anger Balram since he had planned for Subhadra to be wedded to Duryodhan. Seeking Balram's consent for the marriage might be difficult. Krishna devised a plan for Arjun. A well-known custom among Kshatriyas was to abduct the girl and marry her. Krishna thus asked Arjun to make Subhadra fall in love with him and then abduct her. Having agreed on the plan, Krishna and Arjun set forth towards Dwarka. Arjun had disguised himself as a sannyasi so as to keep suspicions away. At Dwarka, Arjun met Balram. 
Balram, who was fond of entertaining saints and hermits, was extremely happy upon meeting Arjun. He even arranged for his stay and for Subhadra to serve him so that she would be blessed. This worked in favor of Arjun as he could now spend time with Subhadra. Over the coming weeks, Arjun saw Subhadra every day as she would attend to his needs. With time, the attraction between them grew. One day, Subhadra confessed to Krishna her feelings towards the sannyasi and told him that she wanted to marry him. Krishna then revealed the truth to Subhadra, saying that the sannyasi was none other than Arjun. Subhadra was overjoyed upon learning that Arjun had come to Dwarka for the purpose of marrying her. Knowing very well that Balram would not approve of Arjun and Subhadra's union, Krishna told Arjun to abduct Subhadra on the day of the festival, which would be held at the Rivataka Hill. As planned, on the day of the festival, Krishna arranged for a chariot. Arjun mounted the chariot and headed straight towards Subhadra, who was surrounded by her relatives. He pulled Subhadra into the chariot and raced out of the gates. Before anybody could reach them, they had already escaped. After abducting Subhadra, Arjun raced towards Indraprasth. When Balram realized that the sannyasi was none other than Arjun, he was filled with rage. He ordered his army to get the troops ready as he wanted to go to Indraprasth to destroy the Pandavas for the insult. Krishna, however, stopped Balram and convinced him not to attack Indraprasth. He told him that Subhadra and Arjun loved each other. This convinced Balram and he approved of their alliance. Arjun, while entering Indraprasth, was filled with worry. He was unsure about Draupadi's reaction to Arjun and Subhadra's alliance. He knew that she would be angry with him for marrying another woman. Upon reaching Indraprasth, Arjun was received with great joy by his brothers. Kunti and Draupadi were also present. The townspeople had gathered to welcome Arjun, who was returning home after 12 years. When Arjun saw Draupadi, he went to greet her, but Draupadi gave him a cold shoulder. She was not happy seeing Subhadra with Arjun. Knowing very well that Draupadi would not accept Subhadra, Arjun sent Subhadra as a maid to her. Upon meeting Subhadra, Draupadi was moved by her simplicity. Subhadra even told her about her love for Arjun. Draupadi came to like her. They spent hours talking to each other. It did not take Subhadra long to impress Draupadi, who then consented to Arjun's marriage to Subhadra. Having sought Draupadi's consent, the preparations for the marriage began. Balram and Krishna arrived at Indraprasth to attend their sister's wedding. Arjun and Subhadra were married on an auspicious day. The marriage was attended by all the sages and townspeople of Indraprasth. The wedding ceremony was attended by all sages and the townsmen of Indraprasth. Balram and Krishna blessed the newlywed couple and stayed back in Indraprasth for a few days before leaving for Dwarka. In a matter of months, the Pandava household was filled with joy as Subhadra announced the coming of Arjun's baby, who they would name Abhimanyu. During her pregnancy, Arjun would take Subhadra out for walks in the garden and would often narrate stories of his bravery and skills. He would tell her stories of the battles he had fought in the past and his achievements. He would talk about his journey and his learnings. All these stories of war would reach the unborn Abhimanyu as well. One day, when Subhadra and Arjun were out for a walk, Arjun narrated to her the strategies and the step-by-step -step procedure of entering and escaping the Chakra view. He told her that the Chakra view was a military formation, which was an effective form of defense in a war. Arjun told her that the army could be arranged to form a circular grid to entrap the enemy, who would then be challenged to escape from the formation. Arjun was narrating the seventh and the final step of the Chakra view when Subhadra, while listening to Arjun, lost interest and fell asleep. This left the story incomplete. When Arjun realized that Subhadra had stopped listening and had fallen asleep, he helped her to her chambers and put her to bed. Unknown to either of them, the baby had preserved all the knowledge 
it had received before his mother had fallen asleep. This was the start of Abhimanyu's journey towards becoming a great warrior. This event, however, left the unborn Abhimanyu with incomplete knowledge of overcoming the seventh circle in the Chakravyu. Abhimanyu grew up to be a brave and handsome young man. He was trained by Pradyum, Krishna's cousin, and by his father Arjun. Abhimanyu, however, never received the complete knowledge of escaping a Chakravyu, which later decided his fate. When Narad had visited the Pandavas, he had made two important points for them to follow. The first was to have Draupadi as the wife of one brother at a time, and the second was for Yudhishthir to perform a Raj Suya Yagya so as to confer upon the deceased Pandu an honourable status in Indra's court. While the Pandavas had already put to practice the first, they were yet to perform the Raj Suya Yagya. Yudhishthir was apprehensive of performing the Yagya. What constantly worried him was that the Yagya might not be easy to accomplish as it might lead to some form or the other of destruction and suffering. While he wanted to perform the Yagya, he also did not want his people to suffer the consequences of an unexpected revolt. Unable to make a decision, he invited Krishna from Dwarka to seek his advice. Krishna told Yudhishthir that he possessed all the qualities to become the emperor and that he would have to secure the acceptance of being the emperor from all the other rulers. While listing down all the allies of the Pandavas, Krishna reminded Yudhishthir about Jarasandh, the emperor of Magadh. He told him that the kingdom of Magadh was very powerful and that Jarasandh would never agree to Yudhishthir's supremacy. Hence, he should be slain for the Yagya to be successful. Jarasandh had held captive a number of rulers. Krishna recalled the incident when he had to move the city of Mathura to Dwarka in order to protect it from falling into the hands of Jarasandh. Upon hearing this, Yudhishthir expressed his concern. If Krishna himself feared the power of Jarasandh, the Pandavas certainly would not be competent enough to defeat him. It was during this discussion that Bhim stepped in. He told Yudhishthir that the combined powers of Krishna, Arjun and his own strength can bring Jarasandh down. Arjun and Krishna agreed as they felt it was their duty to defeat Jarasandh and save all the kings who were held captive. Yudhishthir was convinced. Having sought Yudhishthir's consent, Krishna, Arjun and Bhim set forth towards the kingdom of Magadh disguised as Brahmins. Although suspicious of their appearance, Jarasandh welcomed the Brahmins to his palace and asked them the purpose of their visit. Krishna then revealed their identities and challenged Jarasandh to fight. Jarasandh challenged Bhim and both of them entered the arena for combat. They fought each other brutally with their bare arms. The fight that had started on the first day of Karthik lasted till the 13th day when Bhim delivered one final blow to Jarasandh and tore him into two pieces. Before anyone could know, the two pieces magically joined together again and Jarasandh came back to life. Bhim was shocked and confused. Sensing his confusion, Krishna tore a blade of grass into two parts and threw them in opposite directions. Bhim took the hint and once again slashed through Jarasandh and threw the body parts in opposite directions. This time, the two pieces could not come together again. The slaying of Jarasandh freed Magadh and Krishna released all the captive rulers who promised him their support and alliance. With this, Krishna, Arjun and Bhim returned victorious to Indraprastha. They were welcomed with great festivity. The Yagya was performed and Yudhishthir was made the emperor. After spending a few days in Indraprastha, Krishna took leave of the Pandavas and left for Dwarka. In Indraprastha, Everybody had gathered to prepare for the Raj Suya Yagya. As a customary practice, kings from all across the country were invited to attend Yudhishthir's coronation. Shishupal, the king of Cheri, was invited too. 
the yagya was held with great pomp however during the yagya an unfortunate incident occurred when the time came to do the honors there arose confusion among the people as per custom the king who was considered most worthy of all would be given the honors of the occasion yudhishthir then rose and invited krishna to participate in the final offerings this gesture angered shishupal who hated krishna and resented him for marrying rukmini shishupal seethed with anger when krishna was chosen for the honor above all the other kings who were present before yudhishthir and krishna could make the offerings shishupal rose and objected to the honor that was granted to krishna he disgraced the pandavas openly by calling them the illegitimate sons of pandu he even insulted krishna by stating that he was of low birth and was raised among cowherds shishupal voiced his objection saying that krishna was by no means honorable those who agreed with shishupal applauded in support in anger shishupal said that krishna was neither of royal blood nor heroic instead to do the honors yudhishthir could have chosen duryodhan or karn not only did he humiliate krishna and the pandavas he even tried gaining the support of the other kings having spoken such harsh words shishupal rose and called upon the other kings to walk out of the yagya with him yudhishthir requested him to attend the yagya but shishupal refused instead he got even more aggressive in the past krishna had made a promise to shishupal's mother saying that he would pardon 100 of shishupal's insults in the yagya therefore shishupal had crossed all limits by calling him names and making well over 100 insults thus krishna rose and calmly walked to the front where he used his sudarshan chakra to remove shishupal's head from his torso with shishupal's obstructions out of the way yudhishthir and krishna made the final offerings and yudhishthir was crowned the emperor after the rajasuya yagya a huge procession headed from indraprast towards river ganga it was customary for the king to bathe in the holy river and cleanse himself the procession comprised of musicians whose music had filled the air with spirit of celebration along with the dancers who danced all along the way the kings from various kingdoms who had attended the rajasuya yagya were also present with yudhishthir in the forefront sitting in his grand chariot the procession moved towards the ganga upon reaching the ganga the sages and priests chanted prayers while the audience sang songs to celebrate the occasion when yudhishthir and draupadi were taking the holy bath sounds of drums and conch shells vibrated through the air everybody spoke of yudhishthir's greatness as indraprast celebrated the coming of the new king duryodhan burned with envy he became more spiteful after the success of the rajasuya yagya duryodhan had already hated the pandavas and had envied the imperial court which maya the demon had built for them the court was created with the best craftsmanship and artistry it was not only a home to the pandavas but in it lived a whole township soon after the completion of the rajasuya yagya one day when the pandavas were sitting and discussing matters in the court yudhishthir saw duryodhan and his younger brother marveling at the beauty of the palace while wandering through the corridor duryodhan came across a crystal floor and mistook it for a pool of water he lifted his robe to cross over and realized that it was only a crystal floor this caused him much embarrassment as he walked ahead he came across a pool which was adorned with lotuses this time he was convinced that this too was an illusion and that the pool was actually a crystal floor he thus walked ahead and fell into the pool drenching himself from head to toe as if this humiliation was not enough draupadi who had been watching duryodhan's fall laughed out loud and added salt to the korava prince's wounds insulted by the mockery duryodhan walked out of the pool and stormed out of the palace of illusions while everybody laughed at duryodhan yudhishthir tried to stop him but it did nothing 
to mitigate Duryodhan's hatred for his cousins. After leaving Indraprastha, Duryodhan was filled with vengeance. He burned with anger every time he thought about the incident that had occurred at Indraprastha. Duryodhan spent days pondering ways in which he could avenge the embarrassment that was caused to him in Yudhishthira's court. This time, he was determined to destroy the Pandavas and take away all that they possessed. When Shakuni, Duryodhan's uncle, visited him, Duryodhan confided in him his feelings. Duryodhan told Shakuni of his humiliation in open court and how he was mocked by the Pandavas. He even told him about how Shishupal was killed and how all other kings supported the Pandavas. Duryodhan envied the Pandavas for their strength and the support they had gained in very little time. Desperate to avenge the Pandavas, Duryodhan told Shakuni that he, along with his brothers, would attack the Pandavas by organizing his troops and exterminating them. Shakuni told Duryodhan that even the strongest forces cannot defeat the Pandavas in battle. It would be foolish to fight the Pandavas as victory would be on their side. Shakuni then hatched a plan. He told Duryodhan that Yudhishthir was very fond of playing dice, although he wasn't very good at it. Shakuni, on the other hand, was extremely skillful at the game of dice. He knew that if Yudhishthir was challenged, he would never refuse. Shakuni told Duryodhan that he would play for him. He would defeat the Pandavas and take away their kingdom without any bloodshed. The game of dice would prove to be deadlier than the sword. Having decided on the plan, Duryodhan and Shakuni approached Tritrashtra. Duryodhan told his father about the incidents that had occurred at Indraprastha, all of which had left him extremely humiliated and unhappy. Shakuni proposed his evil plan to Tritrashtra. Upon hearing the devious plan, Tritrashtra was shocked and desired to consult Vidur, who was known for his wisdom. When Vidur came to visit Tritrashtra, he told him about his son's plan. He asked him to go to Indraprast and invite the Pandavas to Hastinapur for a game of dice. Although Vidur expressed his fear and condemned the plan, he followed Dhritarashtra's order and set out for Indraprast. At Indraprast, Vidur was received warmly by the Pandavas. He told Yudhishthir about the invitation and even told him that gambling might lead to disputes among the cousins. He told him that through the game of dice, the Kauravs wished to destroy them. As a Kshatriya, Yudhishthir was bound to accept all challenges related to gambling and fighting. Knowing full well the deceit the Kauravs were employing, Yudhishthir agreed to the invitation. Having made his decision, Yudhishthir made arrangements and set forth their journey to Hastinapur. When Vidur visited the Pandavas and told them about the invitation, Yudhishthir agreed to the offer. Although suspicious of Shakuni's guile, Yudhishthir could not reject the invitation. Yudhishthir loved to gamble and rejecting the invitation would have tainted his honour. The third reason was that Yudhishthir did not want any unnecessary disputes to arise with his cousins by rejecting the offer. Hence he agreed. Upon reaching Hastinapur, the Pandavas were received with little enthusiasm by the Kauravas. Duryodhan and Shakuni were overjoyed to see the Pandavas accept their offer. After spending the night in their rooms, the Pandavas were guided to the imperial court at Jayant the next morning, which was built specially for the game. Seeing the splendour of the grand court that Maya had built for the Pandavas, the Kauravas imitated the same by constructing the court at Jayant. At the court, the Pandavas sat against Shakuni and the Kauravas. The game of dice was played before them. Before the game commenced, Duryodhan announced that he would supply all the coins and gems while his uncle would roll the dice for him. Yudhishthir protested as assigning a substitute went against the terms of the game and was not allowed. Shakuni, in response, accused Yudhishthir of being a coward. To avoid arguments, Yudhishthir conceded and the game of dice began. The hall in which the match was taking place was filled with audience who held their breath with apprehension. Among them were Bhishma, 
Vidur, Drorn and Dhritarashtra. They were all anxious about the game. There seemed to be much tension in the air. Before the dice was rolled, Yudhishthir wagered his wealth of pearls while Duryodhan bet his wealth of riches. Shakuni, the master gambler, threw the dice and won the first match. This made the atmosphere more tense as people were apprehending the worse. With the first victory, Duryodhan took possession of the Pandava wealth of pearls. The game, however, did not stop. Yudhishthir went ahead to wager his treasury of gold, silver and fine jewels. As the dice was rolled again, sounds of cheers for Shakuni vibrated through the hall. Shakuni won the second round too and took possession of Yudhishthir's wealth. Following his defeat, Yudhishthir wagered his chariot, his army, his horses and his kingdom, all of which were taken away by the Kauravas in the successive rounds as they kept winning round after round with Shakuni's help. Having lost all his wealth and possessions, Yudhishthir was now left with nothing. While Shakuni and Duryodhan instigated Yudhishthir to gamble, Yudhishthir wandered into confusion and indecision. The decision he would make now would spell doom for his clan in the days to come. Yudhishthir bets all he has and chooses to continue playing the game. Having lost all his riches, Yudhishthir had nothing more to wager. Shakuni had won every round, taking away all the possessions the Pandavas had. The game, however, did not stop with Yudhishthir losing all he had. Unwilling to give up, Yudhishthir then announced his next possession he would wager. To everyone's shock, Yudhishthir wagered his brother Nakul, who was a powerful warrior and was one of Yudhishthir's prized possessions. Shakuni rolled the dice again and the result was in his favour. Nakul was lost to the Kauravas and Yudhishthir could do nothing. Struck by desire to continue playing, Yudhishthir then staked Sehdev, who knew all the principles of morality. Shakuni rolled the dice and Sehdev was lost as well. Yudhishthir was convinced that Shakuni was employing some evil technique of rolling the dice. This made him even more desperate to keep playing, hoping that victory would soon favour him. Thus, he wagered his next brother Arjun, a master at archery. Shakuni rolled the dice and won Arjun from Yudhishthir. All the elders watching the game let out cries of protest and requested that Yudhishthir end the game. But the obsessed Pandav did not stop. He wagered Bhim, who was the strongest warrior among them all. Shakuni rolled the dice and won Bhim. With nothing left to wager, Yudhishthir put himself on stake and to the surprise of nobody, lost himself to Shakuni. The loss of the Pandavas in the game of dice spread waves of shock and fear among all gathered. Shakuni and Kauravas celebrated their victory, while the Pandavas became spiteful towards them. Shakuni's plan, however, was not quite done. The Pandavas were going to lose more still. The game of dice which began with Yudhishthir losing all his possessions did not end with losing himself and his brothers to the Kauravas. After the previous round of losses, Shakuni announced in open court the victory of the Kauravas. He made an offer to Yudhishthir saying that he could win himself back from their slavery by staking Draupadi. Yudhishthir, against his better judgement, conceded to Shakuni's suggestion. This caused everyone to disapprove Yudhishthir's decision. Shakuni rolled the dice and won again. With this ultimate victory, the Kauravas rejoiced. Duryodhan called for Vidur and asked him to go fetch Draupadi. He ordered saying that she should henceforth serve as the maid of the palace and clean the floors. Vidur immediately objected to Duryodhan's order. He said that Yudhishthir had no right to wager Draupadi, especially after he was lost to the Kauravas. He even warned Duryodhan of the wrath he was inviting and cautioned him of devastating consequences of his action. These words, however, fell upon deaf ears. He was brimming with pride to even pay heed to Vidur's warnings. 
Duryodhan then ordered his guard to go fetch Draupadi. Upon reaching Draupadi's chambers, the guard informed Draupadi of the events that had occurred. He told her that Yudhishthir, drunk on gambling, had lost her to the Kauravas. She was to serve as a slave to them and that she was commanded to present herself before the court. Agitated by what she heard, Draupadi refused to step out of her chambers. She could not believe that Yudhishthir would stake her to the Kauravas. Furthermore, having lost himself to the Kauravas, he no longer had any rights to decide her fate. She sent the messenger back with the message of her refusal. Draupadi's message angered Duryodhan, who then ordered his brother Dushasan to bring Draupadi forcibly to the court. Dushasan obeyed his order and rushed to fetch Draupadi. Dushasan walked into Draupadi's chambers and like a hunter, ran to grab his prey. Draupadi, on the other hand, ran to save herself from the predator. Dushasan, however, caught hold of Draupadi's hair and dragged her out of her chamber to the assembly hall. Those who were gathered in the assembly hall were frightened by what they saw. Draupadi, with her clothes torn apart and locks scattered all over her face, was crying out for help. Seeing the helpless faces of her husbands, she pleaded to the elders for help, but none came to her rescue. Dhritarashtra and Bhishma sat helplessly. The ideas of morality and virtue had lost their meaning. Meanwhile, Duryodhan, Shakuni and the other Kauravas laughed and mocked Draupadi and the Pandavas. Draupadi was called names and was pointed fingers at. Her rage knew no bounds. Her words fell like fire but nothing changed. As she lay helplessly on the floor in the open court, Draupadi closed her eyes and prayed to Krishna. She knew that Krishna would protect her in the worst situation that was yet to come. Draupadi was in shock. How could her husband stake her? Not only had they wagered their own dignity, they had also wagered her dignity. Though her eyes stared at the defeated Pandavas, her only hope now was Krishna. Karn said that as slaves, the Pandavas deserve no clothes and that they should be stripped off their garments. He even commanded that Draupadi be stripped off her clothes. The Kauravas cheered as Dushasan caught hold of Draupadi's garment and started pulling at it. Draupadi tried to stop Dushasan and looked to her husbands for help. But upon finding that they were helpless before their fate, started chanting the name of Krishna. The audience looked on in horror. Many of those gathered even covered their eyes. But as Dushasan pulled at Draupadi's garment, it began to seem that there was no end to it. The more he pulled, the more cloth kept piling up. Soon there was enough cloth at Dushasan's feet to make a hundred saris. It was now that Bhim could no longer stand Draupadi's suffering. He rose from his seat and pledged to avenge this humiliation. He vowed to kill Duryodhan. In response, Duryodhan let out a laugh and signalled Draupadi to sit on his lap. This sight was enough to infuriate the Pandavas. They pledged that they would devastate the Kauravas. Arjun swore to kill Karn and Sehdev vowed to kill the deceitful Shakuni. They announced in court that the oncoming war between the cousins will cause the end of the Kuru race. Upon hearing these frightening words, Dhritarashtra rose from his throne and commanded Dushasan to let go of Draupadi. In an attempt to pacify matters, Dhritarashtra asked Draupadi to demand anything she desired. Draupadi asked that Yudhishthir be freed from slavery. Upon Dhritarashtra's request for a second boon, she asked for freedom for the Pandavas and their kingdom. When Dhritarashtra asked Draupadi to make her third demand, she refused, saying that her husbands will achieve their ends without any help. With this, the Pandavas took leave of the Kuru elders and left the city of Hastinapur. The Pandavas left Hastinapur with blood in their eyes and wrath in their heart. The humiliation the Kauravas caused to the Pandavas was going to bring about wreckage. Everybody runs at the sound of math, but guess who did not run away from it? The same guy who conquered it and made remarkable discoveries in the field. Krishna, however, did not want the people of Mathura to suffer the consequences of war. 
He wanted the people to be safe.